The last thing we talked about is the dua and al qadr. Now, do you know how the dua is battles al qadr? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something, how your dua can affect that by the ultimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you make a dua at some point, this will have, has, have changed. But then Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah he says, look, we have to also understand something very important. In order for this to be effective, in order for qadr to be changed by that dua, you need to bring with the dua another qadr. So al qadr will change because of another qadr. And he says this is one of the most important things people need to understand. Just making a dua does not necessarily changing what Allah had decreed for you. So many, many people, they make dua in the last minute. And they forgot that in order for them to get to this moment where the dua needs to be accepted, you have to do what Abu Dhar said, that you have to live a life of righteousness, so that little dua will be answered right away. So that's why he says you have to have the qadr, the asbab, the means, that will bring that change to happen, so your dua will only be just another push. That's all. And that's something he was emphasizing, and then he says, however, he goes, فَهَذِهِ الْمَسْأَلَةُ مِنْ أَشْرَفِ الْمَسَاءِ One of the most important مسائل that people need to understand and brings you happiness. But you have to observe two things. The first thing he says, in order for this qadr to affect the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, too, that he decreed for you, he says, لَا بُدَّ You have to bring two things. Number one, أَنْ يَعْرِفَ تَفَاصِيلَ أَسْبَابِ الشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ That you have to understand the means to good and evil. What really leads to good, what leads to evil. وَتَكُونَ لَهُ بَصِيرَةٌ فِي ذَلِكَ بِمَا يُشَاهِدُهُ فِي الْعَالَمِ And you have that insight and by observing what happens around you, which means learn from the experience. If you know someone has done something that led him to commit a haram or a sin, then don't do it. Learn from those who had gone through this path before you. قَالْ وَمَا جَرَّبَهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَغَيْرِهِ And also from your personal experience. If you know that being alone in a room the most likely is going to cause you to go on a haram site, then avoid being alone in those moments. If you know that being around these people, they will gravitate me to get somewhere, then avoid being in the, with those people. The whole idea is that you need to know that for the qadr to be affected you know, by dua, you also need to, be, to bring the, 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 the counter qadr to it by bringing the asbab to safety. And that's what we mean by the title of tonight is the delusion of safety. Many of us, they think, alhamdulillah, as long as I'm doing my istighfar, my ibadah, my ta'a, I'm good. Whatever sin I commit, alhamdulillah, Allah will forgive it for me. This is the delusion of safety. We need to learn this. Now, one thing I want to bring here to the table as well is that to understand that we all, at some point, all of us, as a matter of fact, we, have, we share that level of ailment from this, from this uh, uh, issue, which means we all have that level of delusion that we think, alhamdulillah, at some point, I'm good right now. You know what, I've done enough of this. But it's extremely dangerous when people start depending on those moments of uh, what we call delusion of safety, and then they stop and they stop using that qadr of doing the right thing and of abstaining from the wrong thing. Otherwise, if we don't pay attention to that, we will continue to do the, the, the sinful life, always depending on Allah's mercy. Mm -hmm. A few things, Shaykh, um, subhanAllah, immediately stick out. He says, وَمَا جَرَّبَهُ فِي نَفْسِهِ وَغَيْرِهِ When mm. he is tested with himself and others. Every single person around you is a potential version of you, in good or in bad. And so he says, مِنْ أَخْبَارِ الْأُمَمِ الْقَدِيمَةِ وَحَدِيثًا uh, The stories of the nations that came before and the stories of the nations today. The individuals around you, the people around you, everyone has an attribute that you are capable of having of good or of bad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as He gives you the example of destroyed nations, He gives you the example of very unhappy and unfulfilled people. Mm. And who has taken a path away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and found fulfillment in that? And so you see people that have it all yet have nothing. And on the other hand, people that have nothing yet seem to have it all. And that's a proof for you. Uh, and when it comes to it, husn of one billah, because I think this is what we're really getting to, is this idea of a good assumption of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you're still thinking along the lines of ad-dawa ad the disease and the cure. So we talked about the Qur'an. In order to benefit from the Qur'an, there are asbab. There are things you have to do in order for the Qur'an to be a shifa for you, to be a cure for you. In order for the du'a to be answered, 
There are asbab, there are means. The means are the good deeds and the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just like with physical health, it's, don't just take the pill, don't just take the medicine. There's a list of requirements for you that precede the illness and that also either hasten the cure or delay the cure or make it impossible. Likewise, when it comes to husn al-dhan billah, so this is a new medicine, right? Which is a good assumption of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your hope in Allah, your hope in Allah, your hope in Allah. We live in an age where we emphasize hope, right? Likewise, when it comes to your hope in Allah, that's the cure, husn al-dhan billah. The asbab, the means, also exists there, right? What's the responsibility that you have so that your husn al-dhan billah your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a real one and not a form of delusion. Because you even find, subhanAllah, I was thinking about this, yesterday we read Surah Yaseen Sayyid. Mm. And you look <clears throat> at these people that disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they speak very well of Allah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the man in Surah Al-Kahf, I don't think that I'm going to lose these two gardens and I don't think the hour is coming. وَلَئِنْ رُدِدْتُ إِلَىٰ Rabbi, And if I go back to my Lord, He's going to treat me well. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانُ إِذَا مَا بَتَلَاهُ رَبُّهُ like when someone's getting it all the way that they want it, despite their sin, even the most wicked people in the world say, God is good to me. Don't you hear that? God is good to me. You, you hear someone whose whole life is fawahish, is wickedness. And they say, God is good to me. Why? I got this mansion. I've got this money. I've got this. God is good to me. That's literally the attitude that Allah keeps on highlighting through the Quran. God is good to me despite me not being good to him. That's really what's being said. And so the Muslim can ingest some of that. And that's what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is about to diagnose. When you say, I expect well from Allah without expecting the next level of your birr, your obedience towards him, that is nothing but delusion. When you are taking steps towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while also expecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring you along, that is devotion. So the difference between devotion and delusion mm. is in the asbab that you are taking, the means that you are taking no. in your journey to Allah. Shaykh Abu Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, now that we know that we have to also, we have to pursue the means for good and stay away from the means that leads to evil. Because now, who decides what's good and what's evil? Unfortunately, we live in a time right now, I believe that a lot of people that take good and bad from what? From what they see on social media. So we see what other people do, especially when it comes to being Muslims. So because Muslims do that, so why not? Like many, many people, they have that delusion. If I move my family and do hijrah to a Muslim country, we're going to be awesome. We're going to be righteous people, inshallah. Ta'ala, and so, on. so they go to a Muslim country, and they realize that in Muslim countries, they have the exact same problems, not even worse than sometimes, subhanAllah, that they have everywhere in the world. And in addition to that, the delusion that since it's in a Muslim society and people do that, then why not? And frankly, that's many of the challenges parents they bring to the table when they take their kids to a Muslim society or a Muslim country or even a Muslim school. So they're, they're, they were eager to raise their Muslim kids in a Muslim environment, but when you take them to a Muslim environment that is not necessarily doing what they're supposed to, they're not using the right means of good or evil. Instead, they're only doing what the society just kind of like imposes upon them becomes problematic. And their kids start having the excuse, well, they do this, they do this in the school, and I've seen these people you know, on social media do that. Their hijab is, and they do the same thing too, and becomes a problem. So Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah says, look, in order for you to understand what is right and what is wrong, and what is evil and what is good, you have to go back to the source. You can't depend on what people do, what people say. You have to go back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and what the Prophet says, and that's what he was talking about here actually in this point over here. So, Going back to the source in order to identify right from wrong is extremely, extremely important. Because other than that, if you like to, to see the point of reference becomes anything besides the Quran and Sunnah, will be delusional. All right. So there are two things that, that Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions um, in the chapter of Husn al-Dhan in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. He says, number one, <clears throat> that you can't use your Husn al-Dhan to change the nature of Allah. Like you can't think Allah a different Allah. So you can't remove the attributes of punishment and the attributes of, of obedience and what is required of you mm. as a Muslim. And number two... So they, they, call this, they call this forcing the hand of God. Like it's a, it's, a, it's a principle in other faiths where they say forcing the hand of God, basically like you're putting words in, you know, in, in God's yeah, kind of uh, speech. So that's the same thing here. You know, look, right. 
Uh, no, if God is, uh, God would not accept this, for example, they keep saying, or no, true God will never accept this, and that leads subhanAllah to atheism as a result of that, unfortunately. Right. So it's fashioning an mm. idol without building the stone. <laughs> mm. That's really what it is at the end of the day. You're making your own version of Allah, and you're saying that's Husn al and Allah. That's my good ex expectation of Allah. So either you try to change the nature of God Himself by thinking it, or two, you remove the commandments that God himself has put, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has put. So you can't husn al your way out of haram, right? It doesn't work that way to where you can change haram and halal based on your husn al and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on your good expectation of Allah. I think what's really powerful, Shaykh, is like, I don't know where you're going to read from, but like where he comes to, uh, when he comes we're going to come like, to that point, but yeah. before we get to this point, we need first of all to explain the awham. And these are the delusions that people have, the excuses that people have for continuing a sinful life or doing something wrong or something haram. Like someone knows that not praying is bad. They know that, you know, hanging out with these friends is awful. Uh, practicing this is haram. Um, uh, you know, walking around uh, uh, in a place that you're not supposed to be in the, the first place is also wrong. We know what is wrong. We know that this is wrong. This association, for example, and I have to mention, for example, al ikhtilat like, for example, the free mixing nowadays between the young people, subhanAllah, without any regard of what is right and what is wrong and who decides what is considered appropriate or inappropriate. Completely, we removed all the boundaries and we created, we fashioned our own, you know, understanding of what's appropriate, what is inappropriate. But that goes again to the same problem. He goes, a lot of people, a lot of people, they're delusion about, you know, what they do. They think that they're okay with that. So he mentions here that this is one of the most dangerous things, and he gave us some asbab. We're going to take one at a time, inshallah ta'ala, so we can explore it. I want you guys to explore this to yourself. Do you have that delusion? Do you have this excuse that, you know, you know what? Wow, I have that, that problem too. I keep talking to myself about this issue. So what are these things he mentioned? So he mentioned them in one paragraph, and then he detailed that. That's on page 29 in the Arabic text, actually. He says, Qal, ولكن تغلطه نفسه بالاتكال على عفو الله ومغفرته تارا. Sometimes we commit sins, but then we deceive ourselves that it's okay. You know, it's, that's fine. Why? Because we now rely too much on Allah's forgiveness and Allah's mercy. وبالتسويف بالتوبة تارا. Procrastinating when it comes to giving tawbah says, not now. I still have maybe more to do. Like I want to make a collective tawbah to all these things. So we keep pushing the tawbah because I feel embarrassed to make tawbah now that I'm going to do something else in an hour from now. Number three, he says, وَبِالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ بِالْلِسَانِ تَارَةً Making the lip service, which is saying astaghfirullah by tongue. Like many friends might tell you, yeah, just say astaghfirullah, will be fine, inshallah ta'ala. Right? Like really? Just saying astaghfirullah is going to erase this big sin? That's not simple. قَالْ وَبِفِعْلِ الْمَنْدُوبَاتِ تَارَةً People, they say, look, alhamdulillah, if you, make, if you commit a sin, just go and make wudu. The sin will come out with the, every single drop from the wudu. And they're calling you hadith, mashallah, for this. Right? And they deceive themselves for that too. قال وبالعلم تارا And sometimes even with knowledge. Like some people, mashallah, they become mufti sab, you know, when they come to these issues. So they commit the sin, and they still come to say, look, Allah subhanahu wa ghafoor rahim He is the uh, forgiving, most merciful. So we should be fine right now. They give the hadith and they quote the ayat, but in the wrong way. Some, they use qadr by saying, look, if Allah didn't want me to do it, he would stop me. But since I'm doing it, alhamdulillah, Allah wants me to do it. Right? So they use the qadr right now in the wrong way as well. So they're kind of like making parallels. And also say, you know, seeing that, you know what? I mean, who am I? Uh, not to sin. Uh, people before me, these people, this and so they basically kind of like compare themselves yeah, to, to other people with that and there is so many and I want to take them one at a time inshallah to talk about them in Allah Azza wa Jal. قال, the first one he says, وَكَثِيرُ مِنَ النَّاسِ يَظُنُّ أَنَّهُ لَوْ فَعَلَ مَا فَعَلْ ثُمَّ قَالَ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ زَالَ أَثَرُ الذُّرُوبِ وَرَاحَ هَذَا بِهَذَا He says a lot of people, he started with this one because he knew this is basically the, 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 the biggest problem. Is a, a, lot, a lot of people, they think that if they do whatever they do, just by saying, Astaghfirullah, all these sins will be wiped out, will go away, alhamdulillah. That's what they think. 
And that's one of the biggest delusions. So uh, one of the things that makes Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah distinguished as well, by the way, is he's actually very familiar with Christian doctrine. Mm. And he was actually uh, conversing with it, uh, those that around him at the time, and some of the excesses that he had seen in those that claimed to be followers of Christ, of, mm. of, of Isa alayhi salam. And so he was actually basically expelling what he saw as Christian doctrine, or not real Christian doctrine, not the actual message of Christ, but Christian practices and Christian thoughts of the time coming into Islam. And so one of the things that you'll see him fighting with, have you ever heard this, this saying, one hand washes the other? One hand washes the other? That's not a Muslim thought. The Prophet said, Follow the sin with the good deed, it will wipe it out. Which means what? After you've repented from the sin, then you put a good deed in the place of the sin that you used to commit. Not keep sinning here and keep doing the good deed here. So he uh, is fighting back against this idea of one hand washes the other. You know, you can live a double life. Basically, keep doing this, but as long as you still come to the masjid, as long as you give your charity, as long so as there's no regret, the problem, basically. There's no regret. So he, you know, he, he's talking about the Sunday syndrome, right? Which Muslims, we have the Friday syndrome, or we have the <laughs> Ramadan syndrome, right? Or the Tarawih syndrome, or the last ten night syndrome, which is as long as I come into this highly spiritual space, I can continue to live a highly sinful life. So he's saying, he actually was saying that he noticed that in some of the Christians around him at the time, and he's seeing that now coming into the Muslim community as well. And subhanAllah, the same, you'll find, I mean, we live in a, in a, in a society that's dominated uh, by these thoughts as well. You'll find it still prevalent in our discourse today, this idea that, you know, look, I live this life, this is my Muslim side, and this is the stuff, and yeah, I'm a flawed person, but we're all flawed people. Mm. So one hand washes the other. Right? As long as I keep doing this and I keep reading my Quran and I keep showing up to the masjid, I don't have to abide by this command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can stop halfway there. I don't have to give up this haram. I can accept that everybody does some form of haram. And the beauty here, or the power of it, Shaykh, is like in the Quran, you're talking about previous nations. So no. the sample size is everyone before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is actually going to talk about delusional Muslims over the last few centuries from his time. So you're talking about about seven centuries between the Prophet ﷺ and him. And he's going to talk about some of the things that have appeared now amongst the Muslims departing from the original revelation of the Prophet ﷺ and how some of those same thoughts that show up with the people of the book also show up with us as an extension of the people of the book as well. So the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, وَأَتْبِعَ al tamhuha That, you know, follow the sin that you commit with a good deed, it will wipe it out completely. That doesn't mean just, you know, like you're saying, that if you do something wrong, you need to premeditate doing something good afterwards, right? right. Like, I'm going to commit this haram in my mind. Once I'm done, I'm going to make wudu, pray to rak'ah, and so istighfar, alhamdulillah will be even. That's not sufficient, right? No. So, so he's, he's literally talking about the idea, and he actually, Ibn al-Qayyim writes, by the way, liman baddal adin al-Masih, you know, he writes about those that change the religion of Christ, the removal of the commandments of God with this idea that all commandments are gone, so long as you know that Isa Islam died for your sins, so there's a similar mindset now. It's all gone, so long as you know that Allah is Ghafoor and Rahim. The commandments are gone now. And he starts giving these examples here in this, in this paragraph. Naam. Before we move forward, actually, as we hear the, the rain, mashallah, coming down on this beautiful 23rd night of Ramadan, it's uh, one of those moments that the dua hopefully will be accepted. So please make sure to make a lot of dua in this night, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. And especially for our brothers and sisters in Gaza, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy Allah for them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We Allah ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate their sufferings, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to restore peace and tranquility in their life. Amen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver them to victory, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Shaykhna, another thing that people they do, which is Imam al Qayyim says a delusional thing as well. He said, Qal, istikhdam al ilm, using knowledge sometimes, using knowledge, but you kind of like twist it, twist the understanding of that knowledge. He goes, Qal, wa qal li rajulun, he says, one time I heard a man who's kind of like he calls himself faqih, like he understands, he knows. Like, mashallah, nowadays, just because you watch a few uh, TikTok videos, you become uh, alama, mashallah, right? Yeah. You know about everything, Tabarak rahman You heard one statement about, you know, romance being rizq, khalas, <laughs> alhamdulillah, rabbi <laughs> alayhi. You're, you're not Ibn Hazm on romance, right? <laughs> of course. You know everything about romance right now, right? It's rizq, man. Subhanallah. So, the idea is that some people, they think that they know everything. He goes, قال, 
فقال بعض المنتسبين some of those who say that they know قال أنا أفعل ما أفعل ثم أقول سبحان الله وبحمده مئة مرة وقد غفر ذلك أجمعه he goes look I do whatever I want to do and then I say سبحان الله وبحمده a hundred time and he said I'm sure that this will be wiped out why? because he says because لقد صح عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم because there's a hadith صحيح that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says من قال في يوم if you say in one single day Subhanallah wa bihamdihi mi'ata marra a hundred times saying Subhanallah wa bihamdihi a hundred times قال حطت عنه خطاياه all their sins will be wiped out completely when كانت مثل زبد البحر even if it was like the foam on the surf of the on the the face of the of the surf and then the waves so he says these people use this ilm but unfortunately to serve their desire كما قال نبي في حديث حديفة إلا ما أشرب من هوا they always seek in, in, in matters of knowledge that which feeds their desires. You know, sometimes people, they look for the fatwa, what we call fatwa shopping, right? You keep going from sheikh to sheikh, from sheikh to sheikh, until you find the one. And he would say, declare the sheikh to be, he is the one, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. But what about the 99 other sheikh that you asked and they said no? Just because someone said, yes, mashallah, that's my imam, that's my allama, right? So that's one of the delusions as well too. That you think that when you hear a hadith or an ayah that you have the answer to everything. And he said, قال, وقال لي آخر. Now Ibn Qayyim is speaking about his personal experiences, right? قال, وقال لي آخر من أهل مكة. He says, one time I heard somebody from the people of Mecca telling me, he says, نحن إذا فعل أحدنا ما فعل, like we, the people of Mecca, saying, we, the people of Mecca, because of their location, because they're near the haram, and they're in the, 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 the most sacred spot on earth. They have access to the house of Allah subhanahu wa regularly. He goes, whatever we do, he says, قال, إذا فعل أحدنا ما فعل, اغتسل وطاف بالبيت أسبوعا, like we do, we take a shower, we make tawaf seven times around the Kaaba, and alhamdulillah, we're done. Our sins are wiped away. By the so way, Shaykh, this became a practice. Oh, like he actually, subhanAllah, writes about it, like in, in the footnotes here, like this actually became, again, like, You've now got a sample size of the Muslims departing from the revelation. Mm. The people of Mecca had this practice where do anything you want and then make intense tawaf for a week, usbu'an, and it's okay. Keep doing you. That's exactly what the religion of the Qurashis was before Islam. <laughs> that, you know, just worship your idol, give your charity, then interest, usury, zina, it's all good. So it is, you know, embracing embracing two-facedness in the religion uh, and, and living this double life as part of the religion and abusing, subhanAllah, all the ahadith about tawaf and how tawaf wipes out your sins for this. And it became an actual practice. And you without see, repentance, that's the key point. Yeah, without sincere repentance. Without sincere yeah. repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Shaykh Ibn Qayyim, for those who would like to hear him talk about this particular, what he calls hayal, evasions. Like many people, they do things and they try to evade the, the consequences. So they try looking for exits out of every difficulty, basically. In his book, Alam al Muqqeen, he has an, most of, almost like one-third of the book, which is supposed to be about fiqh, about the establishment of fiqh and fuqaha and scholars of, of uh, uh, the sharia and so on. Almost like one-third of the book, he talks about evasions and hiyal, which means people try to cheat, this, cheat in the system. Like many people these days, they follow, one time I, I read on a billboard here in Texas, said, look, everything is legal until you get caught. That's in Texas, Ajima. Welcome to Texas, right? Basically, like, if you, go, if you do it and get away with it, you're fine. But once we, we catch you, too late for that. Now, some people, unfortunately, even in the matters of the deen, they start following the same principle. Like, they can do it, it's okay, as long as they're not going to be punished immediately, I still have chance. So they have evasions, they have, they have exit out of every single difficulty. They find ways because now they know. And sometimes, subhanAllah, little ilm, and that's where the dangerous thing, Sheikh, little ilm is much more dangerous probably than no ilm at all. Yeah, because you quote the hadiths. Absolutely. Quote the, the, the sayings. You can go fight somebody and say, you know, hey, you know, Sheikh so-and-so said this, the ayah says this, and Allah ghafoorun rahim. You can go on and on and on, and that, that becomes extreme. And he has so many examples, subhanAllah. And he himself, he said, actually, uh, the most dangerous people for people are ansaf al-atibba wa ansaf al-fuqaha. Half doctors and half scholars. 
He said, because half doctors will kill your body, and half uh, scholars will kill your soul. So you be careful with that, Jama'ah. And our ulama, they say, when it comes to knowledge, it's just like traveling as a, a three spans of a hand. One, two, and three. Because the first span, من دخل في الشبر الأول تكبر. When you enter the first span, it breeds arrogance. Why is that? Because, oh, I heard from the sheikh. Or I read in this book. Or I saw it the other day. And you think you know everything. The second span, if you continue to learn, you don't stop and you continue to learn, you will realize that, oh, there's a lot to know about this issue. She so said that breeds, it breeds humbleness and humility. And if you continue, because now I realize uh, there's a lot to learn before I can speak, you realize that the more you dig into knowledge, the farther your, your goal will become. Why? Because knowledge is just like an open space. It's like open ocean. The more you go deeper into it, subhanAllah, the more majestic it becomes. And it's just like it humbles even more and more. That's when you realize, I know nothing. And that's something we all learned, subhanAllah, from Medina as well. And I can tell back in those days, when we have dinner together as students, you can tell a freshman from a senior from how much they talk. The freshmen, they talk too much. Seniors, they dig into their food. And then when you interrupt their meal to tell them, uh, what do you think about this? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> like, come on, you're about to graduate. How come you don't know? Said, I seriously don't know. Because there is more to it than what you guys are talking about. Like, he knows more than they do. That's why they become actually quiet. So sometimes, ansaf al-ulama, those who have barely touched you know, the surface of knowledge, they think they know everything. They know about the Quran and the Hadith and the Sunnah and the Sharia and, and now they want to debate you even, subhanAllah. So, uh, last thing about this, subhanAllah, um, he quoted a, a story. Uh, one time a man saw a lady walking in the marketplace looking for something that she dropped. She dropped something valuable to her and now she went back again tracing it back to see if she could find it. While she was looking for it, she was making the dua. Allahumma la taj'al luqatati taqa'a fi yadi faqih. Ya Allah, I ask you that don't allow the thing that I dropped to fall into the hand of a faqih, like a scholar. So someone heard her saying that, he goes, what's wrong with you? What's better than a scholar to catch your, uh, your, your stuff? She goes, well, I'm afraid that he has have some knowledge that will actually make him uh, find an interpretation and keep it for himself. A long time. Like some people, unfortunately, that knowledge is really not beneficial to them. It becomes bad and against them. So when it comes to the subject of sins, a lot of people might have read a hadith or an ayah about tawbah, not yeah. tawbah, but actually forgiveness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's afu and maghfirah, his graciousness subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is true all rahmah of Allah azza wa ta'ala, but unfortunately, they don't use it properly to, to uh, uh, recognize Allah, rather just to escape away from him. Shaykh uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu has a beautiful saying where he was asked who the best faqih is, who the best scholar is. He said, the one that doesn't cause you to despair from the mercy of Allah, but also doesn't give you permission to disobey Him. Mm. That's the combination. Mm. He doesn't make you despair from Allah, but He doesn't give you permission to disobey Him. So that's what He said as khayru faqih, the best faqih. And then you have these filters. And Imam bin Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala, I believe it was him, Allahu alam. Man da'i nafsihi fada'i nafsihi, that whoever calls to themselves then leave them to themselves. Uh, so personality cults, right? So someone, you know, how do you kind of detect like someone who's going to take you down a path of destruction? Someone who calls to themselves instead of to Allah. And so in their preaching of the deen, they're constantly making themselves the, uh, the priest, the connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather than connecting you to Allah himself and teaching you how to connect to Allah himself. And the second thing is they make you comfortable. Mm. They make you complacent. Hopeful is good. Complacent is not good. If you're not progressing in your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the only thing that's happening is you're developing you know, an attachment to, this, to, to a personality, that's a problem. The other thing is that when you follow them, they cause you to commit more sins than good deeds. And so this is something that you'll find in some of the writings, actually the Rasul ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah as well. What did they call you to? And as a result of you following them, you start fighting other people on their behalf. So you start backbiting other people, you start dissing other people, you start looking down on the followers of another shaykh, you start doing this, you start doing that. This was supposed to make you a more humble person and purify your heart and bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that's how personality cults form. 
-hmm. And it's all kind of tied, like the prosperity gospel. Again, I mean, because these are notions that seeped into our deen, the prosperity gospel and sort of the... Uh, the 11 million dollar the, private the, jet? The pers yeah, the, the <laughs> private jets. Um, like, we're fighting over parking spots, man. We're not even, <laughs> you know. But like, you know, the idea of what? Hey, you're good. You're good. Just keep following me. Mm. You're good. Just keep following me. Oh. That's a very dangerous thought. So the best scholar is the one who doesn't make you despair in the mercy of Allah. Because No one of you should die except that they have a good opinion of Allah. But never gives you permission to disobey Allah. Yeah, it's okay. This is okay. This is okay. This is okay. This is okay. Where you become complacent and you don't make progress. You know, Sheikh, one of the points that he mentioned, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, قال التوسل بهؤلاء المشايخ والصالحين. Like one of those delusional moments is people, they defer their sins to their scholars and their shuyukh who give them, like you said, the false hope. And uh, subhanAllah, I don't know what exactly the reason for that, but lately I see this more often on social media. All these uh, cults, where you have this particular leader, where you have, subhanAllah, hundreds and even thousands of people standing right in front of them, and he is doing nothing but just standing there and everybody's marveling at his, mashallah, yani righteousness and his beauty. And then they go and they kiss his feet kissed his hand, and God knows what else they do. And all of this because they think as long as he tells them, you're fine, because he recites whatever he recites, and he blows into the crowd, and everybody feels, alhamdulillah, I've been purified, let's go home. So some people this, this have this kind of following, and they do that kind of stuff, and also deceives them so they would never really even need to stop doing anything wrong, because as long as I go to my sheikh, and I ask his help, He's going to just do some recitation, blow into my face, alhamdulillah, I'm done, yani. How is that different from uh, uh, people of other faiths, like in Christianity, for example? So that's going to be dangerous. Yeah, I want to protect this. There's one more point, Sheikh, I wanted to mention here in regards to, he says also, not just al-istishfa' um, bil-saliheen and going to your teachers and this and that, but sometimes your friends and your peers, like what we call it today an echo chamber. You're looking for validation sometimes. And I have to call this out. It's happening today among our brothers and sisters, specifically our younger generation. When someone, unfortunately, they decided to come out with their sin publicly on social media, whether it's on TikTok, whether it's on Instagram, whatever that is, it bothers me to see a lot of good brothers and sisters, good, mashallah, you assume of them goodness, brothers and sisters. Suddenly they go into the comment section and they're cheering them up for the sin that they're actually coming out publicly about. And why? Under the pretext, no, 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 we have to give them hope, inshallah. We have to kind of like keep, you know, keep that, uh, uh, that door open for them. I hear you. But how far do you need to go with this? They're publicly committing something haram. They're bragging about it on social media. And you come and tell them, you know, go get it, girl, go get it, boy, whatever that is, right? <laughs> Allah Mustanya is just like, oh, yeah. and, and it, it's bothered me. To see that the comments sometimes come from brothers and sisters who are supposed to know better than this, who are supposed to tell them, look, may Allah forgive you, may Allah make it easy on you. If you need to talk about this, reach out to me. Other than just kind of put these comments. What do you think about this phenomenon of this, Sheikh? Now? So every night I want to give a little bit of a paradigm shift because mm. I think that's the most helpful way that we can sort of think about this, inshallah. I really want everyone to think deeply beyond what's being said inshallah and apply this to themselves i'm going to ask you all a question does allah love the sinner well, but aren't we all sinners all of the children of adam are sinners right the best mm. of the sinners are those who repent right okay is there an ayah in the quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says allah loves the sinners no there isn't but it's common in our culture to say, God loves the sinners. God loves the sinners. God loves the sinners. You're going to say something? You thought of something? No. <laughs> but, you know, God loves the sinner. God loves you as a sinner. We're all sinners. God loves us as sinners. I want you to have a paradigm shift here. Don't say Allah loves the sinner. Say Allah loves the repenter. Because how many times does Allah say he loves the repenter? Mm -hmm. Allah loves the repenter despite their sin, their inevitable sin. But Allah does not say Allah loves the sinner, even though we're all sinners and we're repenting because we're all sinners. 
Allah loves the repenter. Allah loves the repentance. But that is a paradigm shift that we have to have as well because otherwise we do really ingest. By the way, in a well-meaning way, like I have no doubt, Shaykh, that a lot of these people that you're mentioning, I know we're mentioning it jokingly, but they mean it from a good place. Yeah. Like, I don't want to lose this person. I don't want them to leave Islam because they left off something from the deen. I want them to know they still have a path back. The way to do that is to tell them, Allah loves you when you turn back to Him. Don't let your turn away from Him become too distant and we will always welcome you back and Allah is still calling you back and you are redeemable. Not your sin is acceptable. You are redeemable, not your sin is acceptable. We've got to have that paradigm shift because otherwise we use the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so inappropriately. And this is where, by the way, this is one of the most difficult sections in the book because he starts talking about all the nations that Allah destroyed. If you were just going to say that, well, look, Allah can be whatever you want him to be. Why did Allah do this to the people of Shu'ayb? Why did Allah do this to the people of Lut? Why did Allah do this to the people of Nur? Why did Allah... He starts listing the destruction of nations. And he's saying, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is someone that wants you to know he's Rahman. Nabbi ibadi anni an al ghafur rahim. Let my servants know I forgive. And that's one of the wisdoms the ulama mentioned here, by the way, of using ghafur first, because in order for there to be ghafur, there has to be istighfar here, right? Allah is always ghafur, but in order for you to encounter al ghafur, the forgiving one, there has to be istighfar, seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Al Qadi Ayyad, rahimahullah, he actually commented on that verse. And he talked about husn al billah. And he said that husn al in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ay idha staghfara ghafara lahu. When a person sought forgiveness, Allah forgave him. Ida da'a stajaba lahu. When you called upon Allah, He answered you. Not He answered you and He forgave you without you seeking forgiveness and seeking Him. Mm-hmm. No. When you made tawbah, He accepted you. And the delusion, again, like don't think about the, like sometimes these examples are so ridiculous. And it's easy for us to say, ha ha, Bani Israel, crazy. Ha ha, people of Mecca in the 14th century, crazy. You know, we would never be like that. But we've got elements sometimes. And one of those elements is where you say, look, I'm a, I'm a sinner, but I know Allah is forgiving. That's one of the most insulting things you can say. You know why? وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِ You did not give Allah His due estimation. Laylatul Qadr, one of the meanings of its name, لِقَدْرِهَا, right? It's estimation. You did not give Allah its due estimation. And the part that shook me in this book, honestly, I read this chapter and I was like, man, subhanAllah, it's like a blow. He went through Khulafa al Rashidin, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, where they're literally saying, like, I wish I was the hair on the body of a, of a, of a righteous believer. I wish I was a tree. I wish I was... Like, uh, they were so afraid of their sins. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Khulafa al rashidin the best of this ummah. They were afraid of their sins. And, and what I, sins we're talking about, Shaykh? <laughs> what sins are we talking about, right? Mm-hmm. We're not talking about the major sins. It's not like they were boasting about their sins and saying, no. It's because Allah was so great to them that their sins, that tanbur ila sigr al ma'asiyah, don't look to the smallness of the sin. Look at the greatness of the one you're disobeying. Allah became so great to these people that the smallest sin became big in their eyes and they were afraid. So the Prophet said, I'm sorry, Shaykh, this was a long mm-hmm. tangent, but it opened no. up a door for me. Like, I, I think of the Prophet when he visited that young man who was dying and he said, Kayfa tajiduk, how are you? And he said, Arjullah, I have <laughs> hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa akhafu dhambi, wa akhafu dhambi. I have hope in Allah, but I'm afraid for my, of my sins. Yeah. I have hope in Allah, but I'm also afraid of my sins. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no one combines these two things except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him what he hopes for and protects him from what he fears. What a beautiful, like that's one of those ahadith. When I read it, I say, huwa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi He was given comprehensiveness. He is the Prophet of Allah. That's divine. For him to be able to quickly say that, that's something coming from the heavens. In one sentence, Allah will give you what you hope and Allah will protect you from what you fear. But if you don't fear your sins, your hope is delusion. And the best of people feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their sins. 
and the difference between them and us and how they approach these ahadith about istighfar and forgiveness and the athkar, the, the, the moments of remembrance. These were people that tried to make sure that there wasn't a spot on their body that was sinful. I mean, like, I'm not missing a spot on wudu. Mm. That I am guarding the ibadat of Allah. I'm guarding the obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with everything I possibly can. But then they inevitably have these minor sins that take place. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ comes with the hadith of, look, salah to salah wipes out the sins between it. Because if you're Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman or Ali, like a moment of ghafla is like a major sin to you. A moment of being heedless, like, man, I slipped with my tongue. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ, his ahadith about, look, say subhanallah wa bihamdihi a hundred times, it will wipe it out. It wipes out the inevitable zalat, the minor sins that take place between these things. But it is not an excuse for you to keep on deliberately disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by just in the face of His command saying, well, Allah will forgive me anyway, so I don't have to do this all the way. Dear brothers and sisters, Ramadan is a chance for you to change. And to say, no, I'm, st- I'm going to stop making excuses for myself by looking around and saying, everybody else does it. Everybody else is going to be held accountable too. I'm going to stop making this excuse for myself. And I will be diligent and try to guard the obligations of Allah. And then at the end, Arjullah. I have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so at the time of death, it's a breath of, alhamdulillah, a breath of relief. And that's where at the end of your life, then you have this hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like at that point, the mm. book has closed with my deeds. I know now, Nabbi ibadi anni anil ghafur rahim. I know Allah is forgiving. I know Allah is merciful. Mm-hmm. And I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that. Shaykh, to, to close this chapter, inshallah ta'ala, I want to uh, give the brothers and sisters a message of hope as well too. So because when we start seeing all these um, uh, ex- excuses that we're giving ourselves to continue our sinful lives, and then we realize, oh my God, I do this, and I do this, and I do this. And eventually I realize I'm doomed then. And then um, how am I going to find my way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I know that I'm completely doomed? So Ibn, Qay- Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, the teacher and the Ustad of Shaykh Islam uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah actually, his, the teacher of Ibn Qayyim Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, قال, وَلَيْسَ مِنْ شَرَاءَةُ الْمُتَّقِينَ أَلَّا يَقَعَ مِنْهُمْ ذَنْبٌ وَلَا مَعْصِيَ it's not a prerequisite or a condition to be righteous that you be flawless, that you, do any, no, you don't do any mistakes. That's not a condition to be righteous. If that was the case, to be a righteous, you need to be completely flawless, have no sins, because no one ever will be counted among the righteous ones. Mm. Which affirms what you mentioned, the idea is not about committing the sin, it's about actually repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that wiped that out. So not just making a good deed, but to come back sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's what makes that sin inshallah go away. Again, as long as the tawbah is sincerely from the heart, not just a lip service or just a fake hope or just saying, you know what, no, I know Allah will forgive me. No, you can't do this. That is extremely, this is the biggest delusion. But you need to make sure that in you, if you would like to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to have to clear the path. The path is, it has a lot of clutter there. And you're going to need to remove all these things. And remember, in order for you to change the qadr of your life, of being difficult, being wrong, being, you know, astray, you have to bring the qadr of righteousness and the qadr of, of, of uh, guidance. Meaning, I have to pursue the means for righteousness and guidance, repentant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking for His help. Only then, I can find my way back to Allah azza wa jal. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. I'll just, in two minutes, uh, yeah. this section here where he says, he comments on, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all sins. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. He says, Wala khilafa anna hadhihi al-aya fi haqq ta'ibin. There is no difference of opinion that this ayah is talking about the repenters. Allah forgives every single sin from every single sinner, no matter who that person is when they turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what they are turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with. 
And if this was talking about people who belittle their sins and don't even return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then all of the ayat of warning would have no meaning to them. So the beauty here is that when you embrace the identity of a repenter, when you embrace the identity of a repenter, so Allahumma innaka afuun to hibbul afwa fa'fu anni, oh Allah, you are al afu, you love to forgive, so forgive me. You know what? Turn back and say to yourself, oh so and so, you love to repent. To hibbu tawbah, you love to repent. Because Allah loves tawbah. Allah loves when his servant comes back to him. You know what, there are a lot of us that are sitting in this room, in this masjid, that last year, when Ramadan was around, we made some promises. Mm -hmm. And we thought we're going to give up certain sins. And we thought we're going to change certain things about our lives. And then it slipped. The fact that Allah Azza wa Jal brought us to another Ramadan, and brought us to another 10 nights, what could very well be Laylatul Qadr. What better way to have your tawbah accepted than to say, Oh Allah, I'm there. And this is the hope of the Prophet ﷺ where he mentions when the man came to him, Shaykh the alcoholic. This is mm. one of the most beautiful ahadith. The guy who says, if I drink alcohol, major sin, then I seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will, will I be forgiven? Yes. What if I return back to it? Then you're sinful. What if I return back to Allah? Then you will be forgiven. Now, it goes on and on and on, right? So the guy ke keeps on basically giving this scenario that you know, look, I, I keep falling back, I keep relapsing into the sin. And the Prophet ﷺ tells him that in Allah la yamallu hatta tamallu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tire of forgiving you until you tire of seeking his forgiveness. And Imam Nawi rahimahullah said about that hadith. He said, What this is referring to is a person who when they quit a sin, they say, Ya Allah, I am quitting the sin. And they have intention and determination, azima, and they feel guilty, they have nadam. They've got the regret, they've got it all there. But then their desire overcomes them and they fall back into it. And here's the thing, the difference between that person that sincerely repented over and over and over again and really tried to quit, and maybe they didn't get it right until the eighth or the ninth time, and the person who simply drinks and says, Inna Allah ghafoor rahim. That person might fall into kufr, might fall into disbelief, not because the sin is, is kufr in and of itself, but just to a point of like, how low is your opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Like, oh, Allah is going to forgive me anyway. This is just a lifestyle. And you know, there are other Muslims that drink and other Muslims that do this. It doesn't matter what other Muslims do. Establish a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala independent of other Muslims and talk to Him on His terms and repent to Him from your sins, no matter how many other people are doing those sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let our hope in Him. Amen be a real hope in him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to continue to make progress yeah, as we ask him to grant us paradise. Zakallah yeah. Shaykh, if I just made another comment to this, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he brought a question, a very valid question, which is part of the delusion that we go through as well too. He says like, people may ask, how come people of knowledge, those who know what the sin is and the consequences and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know about Jannah and Jahannam and you know all that, how come these people still fall into the sin? Like you know all these things and you still go back again to fall into the sin. Because there are many reasons for that. And he gave a few of them. One of them he says, قَالْ قَدْ يَكُونْ ضَعْفُ الْعِلْمِ You do have the knowledge. You don't have the effect of it. Meaning you just have the information. You're just like a floppy disk basically with the old times. Yani. It's somewhere there but it's not connected to the computer so it's really not helping at all. Completely. And the second thing he says, قال, The weakness in the yaqeen, the certainty. Especially the certainty in Allah's mercy, the certainty in their ability to be righteous as well, too, because I'm too messed up, so there's no way I can be righteous. So, therefore, he said there's a lot of excuses people that throw out there. So, that knowledge, even though they know all these things, but they still fall into the sin. So we're going to probably elaborate on this, inshallah, next time. Bismillahi wa ta'ala. Just a few questions we have here, and I think much of this are coming right now. Um, question from Canada. How does one strike balance between having hope in Allah that your dua will be answered, and also not being too excited because Allah might not give it to you? Because it might not be good for you. So how do you the strike hope, this balance? So the hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in knowing that he's going to answer that dua in a way that's best for you. Mm. 
it's not an attachment to the talab, to the thing that you're asking him for. It's the attachment to the one that you're asking. So you have to have the certainty Allah answers the call no matter what. Yeah. How? Yeah. That's to him, not to you. Yeah. So if Allah does not give me what I want, and this is really what it, what it comes down to, by the way. You know, it's, it's hard because we want to make Islam palatable. But there's one thing you can't get around, mm. which is if you love this world too much, and you seek Islam as a means of bettering your world without thinking about the hereafter as your ultimate goal, it's just not going to work. Like no. the equation is always going to kind of be off balance. And so the believer, when they make a dua, they don't get too disappointed when what they ask for doesn't come true because they don't put their hopes in this dunya in the first place. I always come, one of my favorite sayings from uh, Shaykh Hatman Hajj, Hafidullah Ta'ala, I mentioned this before. Uh, and I love him dearly, subhanAllah, and I, and I had the chance, I think some of you, and he would get really mad at me for sharing this story, so please don't mm. share it with him, okay? Like, I know some of you know him. It's but, already, it's uh, already live, Shaykh. We'll, we'll, we're live. Hopefully Shaykh Hatim doesn't watch our streams through the <laughs> night time. But you know, subhanAllah, when he went through uh, a really difficult time, um, when Islamophobes came after him a long time ago, you know, and Islamophobes jump one from our community, by the way, we all have to have their back. And unfortunately, because of his humility, kind of took it on the chin and let people jump him and um, went through a very difficult time. When they, and, you know, he was at the Mayo Clinic mm -hmm. and Islamophobes cost him his job at the Mayo Clinic. And I remember like going to see him and like, man, like you lose a position at the Mayo Clinic and like you're, you know, who's going to employ this guy that's been slandered this way and stuff like that. And I was so blown away by how content he was. I went to see him, spent some time with him in Minnesota. And I'm like in the car with him and I'm like, like what's going on here? And that's when he, he said, uh, this dunya can't disappoint you if you don't have any expectations of it. Mm -hmm. This dunya cannot disappoint you if you don't have any expectations of it. And I said, that's it. That's the sentence. This dunya cannot disappoint you if you don't have expectations of it. So I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah chooses to distribute the portion of that dua for this dunya, alhamdulillah, I will thank Allah. Wa in shakartum azidannakum. And I'll be grateful and hopefully it will mean better. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the whole portion for the hereafter, well, that's my ultimate goal anyway. And I'm sure it's going to show up there. So if, if I made the dua and 20% of it got answered for me here, then I'm really looking forward to the 80%. And if I made the dua and 100% got stored there, then I'm okay with the 100% being stored there. And I'm not disappointed. Because the equation is never going to work with your teskiyah. It's not going to work with your, with your spiritual up, you know, upliftment if you're still trying to use Islam as a medicine for this world alone. This, you know, there's, there's pain medication, and then there's uh, medicine that actually removes the illness. Right? Islam is not the pain medication. Islam is not your ibuprofen or your Tylenol. <laughs> Islam actually deals with the root causes and removes the disease, no matter how painful that process actually is. And that's what the deen is, and that's what we're actually seeking. So if that's an invasive... Heart surgery, alhamdulillah, we need to remove it. I'm not just taking something to, to cope with the headache for now. May Allah mm -hmm. protect us and Amin grant us the best Amin. of this life and the next. Amin Amin Amin. Amin. A question coming from a regretful sinner. If you've been living a life far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can I still make dua to Allah about marriage, good job, and other things? Or should I only focus about on repentance? Like, I don't feel I deserve even to ask about these things. What do you think? That, how would this answer to this? And this is where... The good expectation of Allah is from the one who is in a state of repentance. Mm. You gotta understand that like the Sahaba came from very, very dark lives to being the best generation of people in a very short span of time. And that's because they had to know that even with this horrible past that we have, we have a generous and a forgiving and a loving Lord. So, so long as you are in the state of inaba to Allah, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at that point, Allah is, and by the way, this is the beauty of Allahumma inna ka'afuun, kareemun, tuhibbul afu fa'afu anni, even if the hadith is, but the ulama mention it too, like, Allahumma inna ka'afuun, kareemun, you are forgiving and generous. So he's forgiving, of your sin and he's generous despite your sin 
So not only are you asking Allah for forgiveness, you're asking Allah to still give you despite all of the sins that you put forward because you know that he's forgiving and you know that he's generous as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. I think also we talked about this last night when Hadith al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Man la yas'al Allah yaghdab alayhi. If you don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will be displeased with you. So you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a matter of fact, it's not you want, no, you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything. But as we were talking about it today, in order for this dua to be like the salt in the food, you need to do what? Lead a righteous life. So you need to work on fixing yourself. But never stop making dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your needs. Still, that's part of our ibadah and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A completely random question, Sheikh. So, Sheikh, does Sheikh Omar color, uh, color his beard? Does he what? Do you dye your beard? Uh, no, I got these gray hairs, kind of hide them here. There. Allah Akbar. Alhamdulillah. It's okay, by the way, to, to, to <laughs> cut a gray hair. You just can't pluck it. It's another thing. Though. No. But Sheikh Yasser gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, sorry. Habibi. 23rd night, I don't want to lose my... <laughs> <laughs> you lost access to the office, Khalas, that's it, we're done. We're done here. I'll see you in 10 years, we'll see inshallah. <laughs> At that point, I'll probably die. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, somebody was asking about the three stages of knowledge that we talked about, the three spans of the knowledge. We said the first stage is when you enter the first phase of knowledge, it breeds what, Ajma? The first, the first span of a hand would come to start seeking knowledge. What does that breed? Arrogance. Because you know a few things here and there, you think you know everything, right? But if you continue to learn, it breeds what? Humbleness and humility. That's when you realize, oh my God, I still need to learn more. So humbleness and humility. The third phase is what? That's when you know you know nothing. And that's the stage of true ulama. Like, wallah, we've seen that from our great ulama and scholars. When you praise them, they humble themselves, they say, Wallahi, ma nahnu illa naqala. We're only just carriers of knowledge. That's it. The true ulama, they were from before, but we're just carrying that knowledge to you right now. So yeah, true ulama, they know their place in this world. But those who uh, uh, don't know nothing about knowledge, when they talk, mashallah. It's just like the whole, they're the Mecca of knowledge, yani. that's it. Yani. You have to do tawaf around them, basically. <laughs> For those type of people, stay away from them. May Allah protect us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Naam. Um, what if you did sins knowing what you were doing was wrong, but you convince yourself it's okay because you will do tawbah? So uh, over time you realize how wrong they were. Is their door for tawbah still open for these people? You're like I've messed up for so long and I always told, my, told myself, that's fine. Now I realize this is dangerous. Is there hope? A hundred percent. There is tawbah for the one who deceived themselves into thinking what they were doing was okay and the one who knew what they were doing was not okay. There's tawbah, the sin melts in repentance. That's the beauty. You, you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's gone. It's gone. And just like we can't understand like the process of Allah's answering dua sometimes with all these like barriers because we're used to how we ask of people. Like we find it unfathomable that literally a person can come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one minute after a hundred years of disobeying him and Allah azza wa jal will say, غَفَرْتُ لَكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي Mm. I forgive you and I don't care for it. It's gone. That's because Allah is who He is. And that's also like some people, وَمَا قَدَرَ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ That's also taking away from, like not giving Allah His due estimation. Huh. Here's the thing. Allah is not harmed by your wickedness. Nor is He benefited by your repentance. Right? It doesn't harm or benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, we hold hard feelings sometimes towards each other because there's harm that's done, right? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you never harmed Allah azza wa jal. You were harming yourself the whole time. And so when you have that realization and you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will forgive you. And He wants you to ask Him with confidence that you will be forgiven. Who taught you, Allahumma innaka afuwan tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anni? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who received direct revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Even subhanAllah, Adam alayhi salam, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Adam, you know, when I say put yourself in the place of Adam alayhi salam, right? Like you're the first one to ever do this. Mm -hmm. 
like you can really think you're done. Man, I disobeyed Allah despite having Jannah and everything was open to me and I'm the first human being and now I'm going to get kicked out. This is it. And you can imagine that shaitan, the one who, who despaired from the mercy of Allah, would tell Adam, my son, you might as well just tank now. You know, you and I, we're both going to go to hell now. He's going to tell Adam, just like he told him, eat from the tree, he's also telling him, don't bother repenting, right? When Adam is looking back to Allah and like looking for the words, Allah gave him the words to repent with. <laughs> Allah gave him the words to repent with. Which means Allah wants to forgive you. Yuridu Allah an yatuba alaykum. Allah wants to forgive you. But you've got to be willing to speak the words and take the next step. Allah will give you the words and the next step, but there's the willingness that comes from your end. And that is not something that Allah will force upon you. Allah will not force you to repent. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not stop you from sinning. That's your choice as a Muslim, as a person, as a human being. But the one who turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never be disappointed. Shaykh, adding to this right now, someone is asking a very um, legitimate question, obviously. How do I know that my repentance is even uh, um, is real or being accepted? How do I know that? How, how do I know that I'm sincere in my repentance? So this is a, this is a tough subject. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to entertain this question with you for a bit. Because <laughs> nice. one of the things, like Allah doesn't want us to despair over our past sins. But one of the things that kept Umar humble is his remembering his past. Mm -hmm. One of the things that kept Sa'id ibn Amr humble was his remembering what he did in the past. But it never stops him from doing good for the future. Exactly. So if when you look at your previous sins and wonder, and that causes you to make more istighfar and do more good deeds, that's healthy regret. If you look at your previous sins and say, it's no point, I'm already way too tainted, then that's not healthy. هذا الفرق بين الندم والحسرة Right? Regret and remorse. Hasra is, is not a quality of the believer. Hasra is always in the Quran reserved for the people in hellfire. Right? They have hasra. Remorse, but they never acted upon it. Nadam, regret, is a quality of the believer. Where the believer regrets. I have my regrets. And even if I hope that Allah has forgiven me, I also know that I need to keep growing out of that act of disobedience. I trust Allah to forgive me, but I also want to do more to make up for that time that I was distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a healthy type of regret. And that honestly keeps you grounded. And that's one of the reasons why the ulama were so humble. Mm. People see your good deeds. They don't see your sins. No. You know, like people have like a very, um, like people either make you an angel or a devil. You're either the best person in the world or the worst person in the world. Right? Because people project onto you. And the ulama of the past, they had that. Right? Every, like Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, there are some people that would want to fall and kiss his feet. There's another guy that walks into the masjid in the middle of his dars and says, Anta Shafi'i, are you a Shafi'i? He says, yes, in the kafadirun fasiq. <laughs> you evil, wicked devil. Like he basically called him a kafir. Why? Because he was dealing with social media of his time. <laughs> right? He heard things about a Shafi'i. So you're either, oh my God, or what a devil. The ulama, when, when those people came to them and talked them down, you know what they thought to themselves? Man, he might be right. He might be right. So Shafi rahimahullah, what did he say? Allahumma in kana sabiqan, faghfir li warhamni wa tub alayhi. Wa in kana ghayra dhalik, faghfir lahu warhamni wa tub alayhi. Oh Allah, if he's telling the truth. Like he didn't say, get him, jump him. He said, oh Allah, if he's telling the truth, then forgive me and have mercy on me and accept my repentance. And if he's not telling the truth, then forgive him and have mercy upon him and accept his repentance. Like the ulama actually, when someone said something, they looked at themselves and said, Ya Allah, maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe there's an element to what he's saying about me that's true. And I need to reckon with that with myself. So these people, they live in a different realm, Shaykh. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Their, their life is out of this world. It's somewhere else. Allah yeah. Um A question that was actually repeated multiple times here in regards to some of the examples they say um, that commonly overlooked in today's youth as considered maybe sins in this generation. They're asking, what else that you, could you highlight for us that we might be normalizing without even knowing that? 
Now, I want to, before we get to this, if we want to answer it to begin with anyways, but I just want to remind ourselves what, they started, what we started with. What defines right and wrong, what defines halal from haram, what defines evil from good, is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, not the people. Because if you're going to go by what the people say and do, Allah says, وَإِن تُطِعْ أَكْتَرْ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضُلُّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ If you go to follow the, uh, and obey the majority of the people, they will lead you far away from Allah Azza wa Jal. Those are the words of Allah in the Quran. So it's not about popularity, and that's unfortunately nowadays, it, it goes by, um, you know, how many, how many uh, followers, how many uh, likes, how many comments. How m- it's all about popularity. That's what makes it, what's the criteria for people to say, do or don't, good or bad. We need to go back again to the asl of our deen. The core values of our deen come from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu so, so, so like the Sheikh Omar mentioned, the ulama, if someone comes to them and says, hey, this is wrong. The arrogance, uh, they will subdue, of course, their, their, their ego and say, tell me more. Uh, how can I change this? Uh, how do you know that? Because they really, they pursue the truth. They want to save themselves in this dunya before the akhirah even. And if it's going to always be my ego is hurt or no, you have no right to say this to me and who are you to tell me about this and that and so on. You know what? I don't know who he is or who she is. But like Imam Shafi said, if they're telling the truth, may Allah forgive me and have mercy on me. That's what I need to learn from them. Umar bin Khattab says, قال, May Allah have mercy when someone gifts me my own, my own flaws. Like remind me with my own mistakes. So I can fix them, inshallah ta'ala. Is there anything, Shaykh, in your mind in regards to this young generation of our time that you believe they're overlooking and they're taking too light and too easy that they need to, to, to pay attention to it? If I could summarize it in one thing, I would say Adam al haya mm. a lack of modesty. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Um, haya is one of those words in Islam that's so encompassing. It's so encompassing because there's haya with Allah there's modesty with Allah and there's modesty with each other. So usually when you think of haya, what do you think of? You think of dress, right? So you're thinking about sitr al awra And even, by the way, like covering the awra, so the proper hijab for women and the proper covering for the men and whatever it is, right? Um, that's usually what people think of when they think of haya is they think of clothing. But haya is such a lofty concept in Islam. Haya, how could you flaunt your sin? Uh, whether it has to do with dress or mannerisms or not, like... It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Like, why are you flaunting your sins? Why are you so proud of your sins? Haya, you, you, uh, you have the nerve to talk yourself up and boast yourself up. Aren't you ashamed of your Lord? Put yourself down a bit. So haya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a person who is shy with Allah. So I'm not going to boast about my sins. And then they're shy with the people. I'm not, you know, arrogance is when a person doesn't know their place with Allah. And that's why they treat other, like, other people in certain ways. So it's a lack of haya when you berate your brother or sister. <laughs> Lower yourself a bit. Calm down. So it has the elements of, you know, of, of certainly uh, sitr and covering ourselves and observing the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like you mentioned, Shaykh, like our interactions with each other. And social media is, is just a, a place to, to let out your lowest self. It's an invitation to flaunt. It's dangerous. Especially in the comment section. Yeah, when people commenting how people cross, want themselves. cross of course gender comments and jokes and, and memes and this and that and subhanAllah the, the barrier of haya is, is gone unfortunately. It is. And it's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. So like people even making fun of the deen. Uh, haya with the Quran. Like I see sometimes people joking about an ayah. And I don't want to say other people because then I would be failing to see the tree in my own eye, right? And seeing the branch in someone else. I'm not trying to, to, to say this to everyone else. So I like the, the ease with which we make fun of or make a joke about an ayah of the Quran or like the Prophet Sallallahu like Everything's a joke, right? So it's like turn, turn a hadith into a meme. Uh, by the way, turn my lectures into your, your fun all you want. <laughs> like meme me all you want. Don't meme the Prophet Sallallahu mm. Don't meme a hadith, right? Don't meme an ayah. Like, like uh, don't boast about yourself. Don't put anyone down. Don't flaunt your sins. Have modesty. Be shy. Like you're thinking Allah is watching me like there's a haya with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's also part of that. Like, uh, you know, when someone praises a shafi'i, can you imagine if a shafi'i said, you guys see this guy that what he just said to me? Get him. Like, doesn't he know I studied this long and 
I didn't want to say anything, but this, 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 and this. I was like, he's so shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hayat with Allah, hayat with ourselves, hayat with the people, knowing our station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're ibadul rahman, alladhina yamshuna ala al-ardi hawna. Uh, there are multiple reasons why the ibad of al-Rahman, the servants of the Most Merciful, walk so lightly on the earth. One of them is that they don't take themselves so seriously. Mm. So you think of a person who has a heavy presence, like a person who clings their feet to the earth, there are multiple reasons for that. One of them is their pride, right? Kibir. Adam and hayat. That's also a lack of, of modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another one is their shamelessness. Another one is how they, they walk over people. Right? There's so many fawa'ad, so many reflections you can take from الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَ They tread the earth lightly. Like their presence is a gentle presence. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a shy presence. Unfortunately, social media has become about making ourselves larger than life. And we're not. We're taking ourselves too seriously. I have to worry about myself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So use it for benefit. And use the means that you have, the communication you have with other people. I know some of you are like, I'm not on social media. Why do you keep talking to me about this stuff? Use what you have in terms of what Allah Azza wa has put of people in your life as a means of bringing people up, as a means of bringing other people closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a means of showing your good akhlaq, as a means of teaching good akhlaq, as a means of receiving akhlaq, akhlaqi lessons, the good lessons from people. Like there's a lot to benefit, subhanAllah, from coming from people. Look, when you look around, and I'll end with this, Shaykh, and, and um, I apologize, I went too long. Um, mm -hmm. But subhanAllah, Shaykh, when, when we talk about the normalizing of evil, there's also the good influences. Like there's the, the sahibul misk, the person who's got a good influence as well. Alhamdulillah, there are a lot of us that could rub off on each other in a good way. Mm -hmm. Shaykh Yasser rubs off on me, all jokes aside, on a, in a very good way. May Allah reward you, Shaykh. We rub, we rub each other as well when we're around each other, the presence of other people that are trying, the striving. Remember the repentant. In Allah, you hibbu tawabin. Allah loves the repenters. Wa tubu ila Allah jami'an. All of you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. Some of the scholars said jami'an means together come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa tawasu bil haqi wa tawasu bil sabr. We rub off on each other in a good way as well, inshallah ta'ala. So, haya is sort of the barrier between us and the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the signs of the day of judgment pretty much surround a lack of hayat. People boasting about their wealth, people boasting about their position, people boasting about their sins, people shameless in the public space. Almost all of alamat al the signs of the day of judgment, involve qillat al hayat, mm. the lack of, of modesty and that, that barrier. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that hayat with Him. Amen. Amen. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sheikh, uh, since you brought this up, I, I want to just make this the last question, inshallah ta'ala, all the way from Poland. So the question from Poland saying, is it okay to accompany fellows who commit negative actions even though you know you would never commit those sins? All right, here's so the... So basically they say <laughs> that dust is not going to come on, on their shoulders. Unpopular take, all right? You need to let some of your friendships die. Yep. You need to let some of your friendships die. For the sake of That's Allah. one of, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some friends will take you to hell. Yeah. You need to let some of your friendships die. And so that doesn't mean that you become arrogant and shut the door on them. That means that, look, when I hang out with you, I'm talking in a certain way. Things are being normalized in a certain way. I'm acting in a certain way. I don't want to meet Allah talking like this or acting like this. So... Sure, can, I, can I comment on add to yeah. this point exactly yeah. quickly? The foul language. Yeah. It's becoming so easy for young men and women to speak, you know, uh, bad language in front of each other and use and a profanity, a, a, a lack of hayat. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes it happens across the, you know, in front of the opposite gender. Like they're talking just like normal and they start throwing all these cuss words in front of, you know, each other, even though guys are speaking in front of girls and girls are speaking in front of, of guys and they have no problem. There's no shame, no hayat. Even in a righteous cause. We're all fighting for Palestine right now. Look, it's awkward. It, it's weird to see a person who wears hijab or a person who's in the masjid with a beard start throwing F-bombs. It doesn't fit. That's not who the believer is. We're not like that. That's not who we are. Let's distinguish ourselves. Let's excuse some of the anger that happens sometimes and like other people are going to start going. We're not foul people. The Prophet ﷺ could express himself without becoming foul. Again, these are ideas that are not popular, super popular ideas. We don't need that. 
We don't need that as Muslims. Keep your tongue pure. You can be dedicated to justice. You can be speaking the truth. Keep your tongue pure. Don't start, don't start talking like that. That's not who you are. Other people, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and guide them for the goodness and forgive them for their shortcomings. But let's not, let's not adopt that as identities for ourselves as well. No, like, you want to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Rasulullah's face would become red at injustice. His voice would bolt alayhi salatu wasalam. The same person whose voice was so low and so modest alayhi salatu wasalam when he saw injustice. But with that, like he never departed from that essence, that prophetic essence that he had alayhi salatu wasalam. Keep that about yourself. Again, it, it just keeps coming back to it. So yeah, people around you, they talk a certain way, you're going to start talking like them. And by the way, this isn't just kids. Some of the worst backbiting I have ever heard is in the presence of students of knowledge. It becomes a culture because when the religious do it, that's kind of, well, they probably know, you know, they probably got their own, like, their way out of it. When the religious do it. And again, it's like when, when you kind of get these cults and stuff like that amongst, amongst groups of, of, of students of knowledge and this madhab and this, this and this and this firqa. Like, people start talking about other people. And you look around, you're like, well, everybody's a sheikh here. Well, everybody's a talib ilm, everyone's a student of knowledge, everyone's a masjid goer. So when they backbite, it's like people kind of like, well, it must be okay if everyone else is speaking this way. It's not okay. So we have to check each other. But some of your friendships have to die. Some of those relationships have to go if you want to grow in your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never let your sense of loyalty to a person take you to hell. Don't let it happen. I love you, I care for you, but I've got to go. <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm on a relationship, I'm on a, I'm on a path. And I'm happy to bring you along and I hope you come with me. But right now, I've got to go. I've got places that I'm trying to get to. No. And I love you and I care for you, but I, can't, I just can't you know, stay she, in this way. She, subhanAllah, that reminds me of the last thing I have. Shall we close with this with the last Azzawajal? Is that um, our time today, I don't want to make that resemblance to be any 100% in terms of accuracy or otherwise. But it's so close, it's so close to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu how much the people needed Islam on that time. Like at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Haya was gone, goodness was gone, religiosity was gone, everything was gone. People were living completely ridiculous life. Yeah. Whether it's in Persia, in the Byzantine state, in Egypt, in Yemen, all these places, they were completely far away from God. Because the last prophet that was sent to them was 500 plus before the Prophet So at that time when Islam came, it was easy for people to take it, you know, outside of course, away from arrogance and so on, because they needed that message. That's why the poor people, they were easy to go and follow that message. SubhanAllah, in our time, it seems we have the same, the same maybe perils happening right now. As Muslims, a jama'ah, in this time, in this wallahi time in our society, around the world, even Muslim countries, we are the final, the last يعني, line of defense. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrjat nas," You are the best nation ever produced to mankind. What is the first quality he said about that, that ummah? Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar. Because you enjoin good for good evil. Not because you were faithful, you were believers. No, that came afterwards. Qawwa tu'minuna billah. And you believe in God. No, he said because you enjoin good for good evil. What does that mean? You are the final de line of defense here. You are the protectors of faith, the protectors of deen. Even religious groups of other faiths, they diluted their iman, their deen, like Sheikh mentioned, subhanAllah, like you shape it in a way, you fabricate your God in a way to suit your desires, your needs these days. And you start worshiping a delusional God right now. And you try to find justification in religious text. And if Muslims are going to start doing this about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and justify all their deeds uh, because of the lack of haya and lack of responsibility and accountability. How different are we going to be from these people? We are the final line of defense for Allah come to the deen. That's why a lot of non-Muslims, when they come to Islam, what do they say about Muslims? Discipline. Look at you guys. What time is it now? 2.25 a.m. And the masjid, mashallah, is full. Where do you find these people coming these nights after nights to have that self-discipline. But I hope we enhance this beautiful self-discipline moment with more, inshallah ta'ala, of goodness. Not just for the moment of emotional high and then that's it, we go to all the old ways. I hope 
that we understand our responsibility in this life, in this dunya, is bigger than your social media account and the number of followers you have. It's bigger than you. And if you can put yourself in this equation, that I am an agent of goodness, I'm an agent of khair, I am the, 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 the messenger of Islam to the world, and Allah chose for me to live in this time, in this age, in this stage, in this place, for a reason. Make sure to utilize that in the best way, inshallah ta'ala. You will see that your value will increase. Suddenly you realize, oh my God, I am more important than just few followers. It's bigger than this, Jama'ah. And I hope, inshallah, we can hear this message, bidnillahi, tabaraka wa ta'ala. Is there anyone like the people of Gaza in this regard to when we talk about al-haya? Does, does anything contradict haya from the people of Gaza? Anything. As a collective. Individuals exist everywhere, right? That might be in contradiction to the, to the culture. Mm. But does anything about the way those people are right now? We always talk about it, say, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakeel la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Have you seen more modesty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with each other than the people of Gaza? Have you seen more chivalry? Have you seen more futuwa <laughs> than the people of Gaza? Uh, they are, they're manifesting that, subhanAllah. Even the ladies, wallahi, it, it brought tears to my eyes hearing one of the sisters wearing her salah garment or garb. She goes, we always wearing our, our garment, our hijab garment, because we don't know when we're going to die. We want to be ready, that we're covered when we die. Like they don't even take off their hijab anymore in their own houses, their own, their own rooms, out of fear that this could be their moment and they don't want to be exposed if they die. La ilaha illallah. It's, it's the, woman who came, the woman who came to the Prophet with the, with the seizures and said, Ya Rasulullah, it's, I don't want to be cured if, I, if it means I can get Jannah, but just can you make dua that I not at the so I'm not exposed. And now in our time, and we're seeing a whole bunch of women in Gaza. It's not one woman or two women. Mm -hmm. It's a culture that they sleep in their salah clothes so that if they die, they're not exposed. SubhanAllah. I mean, these people are giving us a look of Ahlul Yaqeen. These are people of Yaqeen, people of certainty, people of all of these values that we... And to live a life beyond this world. Yeah. A lifestyle that's way beyond this dunya and beyond this world. May Allah subhanahu wa make it easy for them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen, Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to confirm the Iman in their hearts. Ameen. We ask Allah to restore peace and tranquility into their lives, Ya Rabbil Ameen. Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them safety in this dunya and in the akhirah. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve them from the suffering, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. We ask Allah to alleviate their suffering, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver that victory He promised, Ya Allah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their shuhada, Ameen. to heal the wounded and give shifa to those who are sick. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to release their captives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring back the absent. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them safety in dunya and the akhirah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And to all of us, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our iman, to protect our haya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to lead a righteous life, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us that which is right and make it easy for us to follow it. And that which is wrong and stay away from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to count us among the most righteous in this dunya and in the akhirah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And the way we all gathered in this place in this moment, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability and the pleasure to meet together and be together in Jannah al Firdaus al-A'la with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as-salihin. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.